verse 11, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Then saith uh, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made. He took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Today I want to talk about Pontius Pilate, and I call this sermon, The Man with Christ on His Hands. The Man with Christ on His Hands. It must be a terrible thing to be in a situation where somebody else is on your hands. Their life or death depend upon your actions. Think of a young, or our new pilot, who is soloing for the first time, and the first time he takes a, a passenger with him uh, in, the, in the plane, he has their life in his hands. Or a surgeon who is performing his very first major operation. He has the life of that patient on his hands. Think of um, a judge who is presiding over his very first capital or murder trial. He has the fate of somebody uh, in his hands. Each one of you should be mindful of that. Think of that when you get behind the wheel of your car, you drive with some passenger uh, with you, or where even without a passenger, think of the people around you. Mind the laws, mind the speed limits, and so forth. But it should be a sobering thought to have the life of somebody else uh, on your hands. For Pilate, it began with a question he asked here in verse 22. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? That's a question he didn't have to ask. The uh, governors of the different Roman territories were called proconsuls. They answered only to Caesar. He didn't need their opinion. Uh, in capital trials, capital cases, he was the final authority. He would decide whether someone's life would be spared or would be taken. But he answered only to Caesar. And uh, he didn't need their opinions. You know, everyone had heard about Jesus. The stories of his miracles had been spread abroad. In uh, John chapter 12, verse 21, we read about Greek converts, undoubtedly, to Judaism. And they come to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And they seek out Philip, and they said unto him, Sir, we would see Jesus, Christ's fame, and his public actions, his ministry, his preaching, his miracles, had been spread by word of mouth far and wide. Uh, the Bible describes quite how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with uh, power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, Acts 10, verse 38. Uh, Peter says in Acts 3, verse 13, that Pilate was determined to let Christ go until the chief priests and the rulers stirred up the people. Our text says Pilate knew that for envy 
they had delivered Christ, wanting him dead there in verse 18. They were jealous of the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't have any multitudes following them every day. They had no multitudes hanging on every word he would speak, going without food, waiting for him to, to feed the multitude, 5,000 men plus women and children. They had no such followings, and they were jealous. You know, the Bible says jealousy is the rage of a man, the book of Proverbs. Uh, jealousy can drive people insane. They're obsessed or they're envious of some recognition, some fame, some attention, somebody else got that they thought they should have gotten. And it can drive people out of their minds. But um, the text says, verse 15, Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release, that is, he was inclined, he had, uh, it was his custom, to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. Verse 16, And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. The other three Gospels, Mark, Luke, and John, inform us that Barabbas was guilty of insurrection, robbery, and murder. Fine fellow, you want to live next door to him, right? Uh, Pilate must have thought, you know, if I offer to let them uh, choose a prisoner to go free, surely they'll choose Christ. Christ had done nothing wrong. Christ had harmed no one. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, when he was in the synagogue, they all marveled and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. When you come to the, the, the John chapter 6, the disciples say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. But uh, if I let one of their prisoners out of jail, give them what they want, surely they'll choose Christ. But they didn't. And this was um, a shock. The chief priests, the rabbis, persuaded the multitude to call for the death of Jesus. Pilate was stunned. Verse 19 tells us his wife had been tossing and turning in bed, probably at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. This trial of Christ before Pilate was very early in the morning. That's sometimes not uh, evident right on the surface. Because when by the time they got Christ on the cross, uh, the the third hour of the day, about 9 a.m. That means all the trial all had to have taken place within the two or three hours prior to that, the scourging and so forth. So she probably woke up two, three in the morning, wondering where's my husband, ask a servant where he's at. Well, the crowd demanded him to render a final verdict on Jesus. He's down at the, the courtyard, an angry mob. I think they want him dead. So she sends a word to her husband, have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day because of him. Uh, we're going to make a big mistake if you put him to death. I just know it. So Pilate was willing to let Jesus go, but the people cried out for Barabbas instead. And then verse 24 says, a tumult was made. It was chaotic, almost a riot taking place among the people, a violence among the people. And rather than standing up to the crowd, ordering his soldiers to disperse the crowd and let Jesus go free. He asked, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They, the Bible says they all said, let him be crucified. I was thinking, as I was reading this this morning, you could preach a sermon outline just on those two words, they all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, doesn't the Bible say? Let him be crucified. What was he going to do? The Bible tells us the fear of man bringeth a snare, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord uh, shall be safe. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Fear caused Adam to lie to God and hide himself in the garden. Genesis chapter 3. It was fear that caused Abraham to lie about Sarah, his wife, saying, she's just my sister, there in Genesis 12. It was fear that caused King David to act like a crazy man outside the uh, gate of King Achish in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 21, slobbering and acting like a crazy man so people wouldn't uh, approach him. Politicians fear losing public support. They fear uh, falling behind in opinion polls. Certain things 
about human nature haven't changed much in thousands of years. And uh, Luke chapter 23 says he offered to scourge Jesus, then let him go. But that wasn't good enough for this mob. That wasn't good enough for the angry crowd. They wanted him dead. And then the angry uh, crowd gave Pilate the, the, the final push he needed to do what was wrong. We read, if, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, as Jesus was alleged to have done, speaketh against Caesar. We read in John 19, verse 12. Pilate couldn't jeopardize his own status, his own career, his own reputation uh, in the Roman government. And so verse 26 of our text concludes with the words, He delivered him to be crucified. And now Pilate was the man with Christ on his hands. He knew Christ was an innocent man. He had harmed no one. He had done no harm. He only performed miracles of kindness, love, and affection. Feeding multitudes, giving comfort to those who were weak, raising sick people to health again, raising the dead back to life, opening blind eyes, causing the lame to walk, healing lepers, feeding multitudes when they had no food of their own, and uh, teaching uh, in front of the scribes and the Pharisees and the people hearing it, and uh, we read in Matthew 7 um, that they, they wondered at Christ, saying, This man speaketh with authority and not as the scribes. And Pilate knew all of these things about Christ's uh, reputation and his uh, image around the people, uh, among the people. It was well known. But uh, Pilate tried to reverse his actions. He tried to reverse his actions. And we read about that in, our, in this text today. And uh, the, we, he knew Christ was an innocent man. According to verse 23, he asked, what, what evil hath he done? And just like millions of people today who, in a way, have Christ on their hands because they have never been born again, they've never trusted in the saving grace and the mercy and the compassion of God to forgive their sins and write their name in heaven, they have Christ on their hands. And Pilate tried to get Christ off of his hands, as we read in this text. And uh, he tried to get Christ off of his hands, point number one today, by placing him in the hands of others. He tells them at the end of verse 24, See ye to it. And when the crowd replies, saying, His blood be on us and on our children, there in verse 25, We'll take responsibility, responsibility for it. Pilate must have thought he was now in the clear. These people are mad, but at least I'm off the hook. But, you know, he thought he was now absolved of sending an innocent man to his death. Telling yourself there's nothing to worry about and having nothing to worry about are two entirely different things. The Bible tells us, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4, verse 17. Sin isn't just doing bad. Sin is failing to do good when you have the chance and the opportunity to do so, and the ability to do so. Pilate just failed that standard, like no other man in all of human history ever failed. Think about that. Pilate committed a sin unlike any other man in the history of the world ever committed to send the Son of God, the flawless, impeccable, perfect, sinless, righteous, virtuous, holy Son of God to his death. Unlike any man that ever lived. And, by, and guilt by association, you're guilty too. So was I. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, your sins have separated between you and your God. And your iniquities have hid his face from you so that he will not hear. It was your sin that brought separation between you and God. And the thing is, you were born a sinner. So from the, from the very get-go, you came out of the womb uh, alienated from God. Because of Adam's sin and uh, that guilt transmitted from your ancestors down to you. 
But um, he turned the Son of God over to an angry mob to be murdered. Telling someone it's your responsibility now doesn't excuse you, doesn't absolve you. Adam told God it's the woman's fault, but that didn't excuse him. And then the woman said uh, it was the serpent's fault, but that didn't excuse her. You can't pass the buck with uh, the burden of your own guilt, or, the, or rather the burden of your own sin, your own actions. Blame someone else so that now you're in the clear, free to go. You're no longer culpable. You're no longer involved in those sins and that action. You can't just say, well, blame him. Therefore, I, I don't bear any blame any longer. Right at that moment, Pilate was afraid of what would happen to him if word got back to Caesar, the Roman Empire, that this man had allowed a Jewish subject, Christ, to claim to be another kind of king without it being disciplined, without some discipline being exacted out on that person. Let him go free. He would have been seen as a very weak Roman governor. Now he's no longer concerned about the innocence of Jesus, he's concerned about the guilt of himself. That was on his mind. And uh, the people might rise up in rebellion against Rome one day if, if more rulers were like him, apathetic or uh, give, give in. He would be seen as weak. And all of these thoughts undoubtedly were going through his mind uh, during this time. Spiritually, it's like an unforgiven man who thinks he can avoid Jesus Christ put off the new birth um, and the eternal fate of his soul by just claiming he doesn't need it. That guy's much worse than I am. I'm a pretty good guy. Um, I don't harm anybody. I'm not breaking the law. Take your old, your old time religion uh, and give it to somebody else who needs it. What a stupid response to the gospel. <laughs> give it to someone who needs it. Well, if all have sinned, all need to be forgiven. And Pilate was a man with Christ on his hands. And putting the burden onto others couldn't excuse him. They couldn't excuse him from that guilt. Secondly, he tried to get Christ off his hands by washing his hands of it. Literally and figuratively in front of the crowd. Notice verse 24 again. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. This was all for show. It was symbolic. It was supposed to make him look like he was now in the clear. He had nothing more to do with the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was now uh, their responsibility. He was no longer involved. And for a brief time, many of the crowd might have agreed by their response. Verse 25, his blood be on us and on our children. By the way, That's not a response that God, the Heavenly Father, could listen to and take lightly. Think about the plight of the Jews over the last 2,000 years. Why does everybody hate us? What have we done to hurt everybody? Why do they despise us? Why do they suspect us of, of uh, disloyalty to their government, to their religion, their so forth? Why does every other country in the world have a, a, a nucleus of anti-Semites living there? Go all throughout African nations that have been dominated by Islam, and you'll find anti-Semitism. Even in countries where there are no Jews living. Go up to Idaho somewhere and find some redneck farmer uh, who blames the Jew for all of his economic problems. I can't get a loan for that tractor because the Jew runs the banks in New York City. Anti-Semitism everywhere. You have people who profess to be born again, and I suppose they can give you a legitimate testimony of having been saved, who think all the promises given to the nation of Israel and the descendants of Abraham, uh, physical, literal, earthly blessings are now transferred spiritually to the Christian to claim that God's all finished with the Jew. That's how widespread the anti-Semitic uh, uh, streak ha has gone all over the world. Uh, there's an anti-Semite over in Arizona, a uh, pastor of an independent uh, Bible or Baptist church. He's, he's King James only. And he's got a sort of a 
a network of like-minded pastors, Baptist pastors, who all say, God's all done with the Jew. Listen, if God's all done with the Jew, why are there still Jews? They had no country for 2,000 years, no flag to fly, no army to protect themselves, scattered from pillar to post, from country to country, and yet they survive. They know who they are. They may not be able to tell you which tribe their ancestors were descended from. All that was lost. But not only does the Jew exist, their language still exists. In 1910, Japan dominated, came in and dominated Korea. And in 35 years, till 1945, they almost caused the the extinction, the disappearance of the Korean language. They forced Jap Japanese on all the citizens. Some of our older church members can probably remember those days when they were children growing up. And in 35 years, the Korean language almost disappeared from the earth. And yet for 2,000 years, the language of the Jew, the Hebrew language, has not disappeared. They kept it in their homes, kept it around their fireplace, taught it to their children. Doesn't matter which country they went to, Russia, South America, throughout Europe, Far East, China, Japan, wherever Jews were scattered to, they still held on to that language. They're speaking Old Testament Hebrew in Israel today, 2019. So anyone that says God's all finished with a Jew has a lot of explaining to do, Lucy. But it's all for show to say that uh, his washing of his hands absolved him of it. And uh, if you have just a little bit of spiritual discernment in you, you should be able to see Pilate's washing is a good picture of a number of things. It's a picture of someone who is depending on some outward gesture, some action, some religious action uh, to affect a spiritual change in his heart. It can't be done. Church membership doesn't guarantee that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Water baptism can't wash away the sin that's still in your heart. Those things may look impressive to some uh, doofus who doesn't know any better on the outside, but uh, they, they, have, they play absolutely no part in your salvation and the regenerating work of the Holy Ghost. And just a few days earlier than this event, Christ had told the uh, temple leaders, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite. By the way, shribe means scribe. Some of you didn't, didn't know that. It's a German word for writing. Scribes, script, scribble, scripture. That's my last name. The scribes were the ones who hand copied and wrote the scriptures. Woe well unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, then the outside of them may be clean also. Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. He was describing their hearts full of wickedness. The Bible says, Jeremiah 2, verse 22, For though thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. An outward gesture can't erase the sin that's still within. Pilate could get Christ off his hands that easily. By the way, I saw something, I read, came across something on the... Years ago, Brother Kogel debated a Church of Christ elder on a live uh, Bible radio program. Oh, it's going back probably 20 years now. And Brother Kogel's mentioned it many times. And I came across that radio interview on uh, YouTube earlier this week. And I would, I would recommend everyone listen to it. He took that Church of Christ elder and mopped the floor with him. Uh, it, was, it was a glorious thing to listen to. I wish there was video of it. But the uh, Church of Christ elder uh, had challenged him to a debate over whether water baptism was necessary for salvation. And the uh, elder went first and said that it was. He gave the standard uh, scriptures that are used to 
1 Peter 3, verse 21, and so forth. The like figure wherein to even water uh, baptism doth now also save us. Uh, speaking of Noah. And uh, he used the standard scriptures that everybody uses to try to teach water baptism. And then Brother Kogel had his chance to respond. And he says, my, like I said, 20 years ago, my two-year-old's at home tonight. It's a little past his bedtime. I'm sorry he's not here to debate this guy because he <laughs> undoubtedly, undoubtedly knows more scripture than he knows. Oh, right out of the starting gate, Brother Kogel just started kicking that guy. And then he just went through scripture, 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 just reading it right out of the Bible. Uh, how that a man is saved by faith and belief, not by water baptism. And you take the weight of the scriptures, uh, if, you're, if you're going to take the weight of the scriptures and put them on a scale, the scales are going to tip this way, by faith and not by water baptism. But this guy couldn't respond to it. But uh, it was wonderful to listen to. Thirdly, Pilate tried to get Christ off his hands by nailing Christ's hands to a cross. There's a great picture of someone who thinks the way to escape guilt is to offer some sacrifice or something else. Once the angry crowd, especially the chief priests and the Pharisees, began telling Pilate about how bad things were going to be for him if he didn't crucify Christ, he forgot all about Jesus' innocence and could only think of his own guilt, his own uh, position. And the instinctive reaction to a sinner uh, who thinks God is angry with him or he stands in judgment of God is to offer up some kind of sacrifice thinking he can appease God or make God happy once again. And the Jews had a system of animal sacrifices which God had commanded back in the Old Testament uh, for the forgiveness of their sins, but it was temporary until one perfect sacrifice came along. Uh, John 1.29, John saw Christ and behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, the animals could get a man so far, could get him as far as Abraham's bosom, but it couldn't get him all the way to heaven. What they needed was one perfect sacrifice to cover their sins forever. Then came the Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy that need. But Pilate, was, Pilate wasn't a Jew, um, and he didn't care about it. Uh, and uh, nor, So he didn't care what the Jews thought. And yet every other religion in the world at that time, and even today, have some concept that they need to offer and make an offering, offer some sacrifice to God to appease his anger, his judgment, or stave off his uh, uh, wrath upon them. It's amazing how universal certain ideas uh, have always been. To slay the one, to slay the one who should have gone free, in order to save yourself and your own reputation. Uh, go back to your wife. Go back to your position. Go back to your authority. Go back to your good standing with the Roman uh, officials. That was even the greater sin. And uh, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ came into the world for the purpose of dying for sin, for sins and for sinners. I'm glad he died for me. I'm glad he suffered for my sake. But whoever wanted to be the one responsible for that, who would ever want to put themselves in Pilate's position and be the one responsible for sending Jesus to the cross? There are some today who think, the way to please God is to offer up a sacrifice uh, that Christ needs to be crucified again. And the priest will hold up the wafer and the wine and say the words of uh, transubstantiation or transmutation and then say, this is Jesus, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. And the people respond, Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And uh, they offer that. It's called the sacrifice of the Mass. He transforms that bread now into the human flesh of Jesus. And then he breaks that wafer in front of the people, thus breaking the body of Christ once again. That doesn't bring salvation. That brings damnation. Read Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 10, verse 12, verse 14. And see that Christ uh, was offered once for all, sacrificed once for all, doesn't need to be offered again. If, uh, if Christ's death had to be repeated uh, over and over and over and over again, it would never be all sufficient, no matter how many times you do it. If it wasn't sufficient once, it will never be all sufficient, no matter how many times you repeat it. And uh, they'll argue that we accept the Bible literally, Christ said, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. 
John 6, verse 53. They'll say, we take the scriptures literally. Yes, but a text without its context becomes a pretext. And Jesus interpreted his own words in the same chapter, John 6, verse 35. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. The way you uh, eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood is by coming to him and believing. It's a spiritual transaction that can only be done by faith between you and God. And uh, lastly, point number four today. I'm going to try to move along here. You can never get the blood of Christ off your hands until you have him in your heart. Jesus told the disciples, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. John 14, verse 20. The way to have Christ be in Jesus Christ is to have him in you. We read, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. The Bible says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 24. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the the Spirit, Romans 8, verse 1. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness, Romans 8, verse 12. If you are in Christ because Christ is now in you, your old nature has been done away with and a new nature has taken over. Your sins are forgiven. God sees you now clothed with the perfect righteousness of His only begotten Son. Your righteousness is no longer measured by how obedient you are in keeping the laws and commandments. It is now whether you have him covering your guilt, covering your sin. And any future sins committed by you uh, have no more bearing, they have no more effect upon the destination of your soul. Um, this is a mystery that's often overlooked by a lot of modern Christians, and it's certainly missed by cults. They don't understand it. But a lot of Christians and, and believers uh, stumble through the scriptures. They're not deep students of the Bible. They don't consider what this signifies. John writes, 1 John 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his, God's seed, God's seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Oh, your flesh can commit all kinds of sin, but not the soul. The soul, this is what brings up the subject of spiritual circumcision. The body and the soul are no longer stuck together. They're now loosed one from the other. So that whatever sins you commit because of the, the corrupt nature and the weakness of the flesh have no longer any effect upon the destination of your soul. It's been regenerated by the Holy Ghost. That is, your dead spirit became alive when, it, when the Holy Spirit of God merged with it at the moment of your salvation. Pilate was the man with Christ on his hands and uh, we'll never know until eternity whether he turned to Jesus Christ after this event he might have lived long enough to understand the gospel perhaps the preaching of the apostles and the, and the apostle Paul we don't know but the possibility was certainly there you can never get Christ off your hands until you have him in your heart 